everybody, Wayne Davies from Spectrum Economics here. I'm back with another market structure video. That's right, so this is now the third video in the series. Back in the old uh, garage again. Gives me that movement like I told you before. So where are we up to so far with the uh, series anyway? So, first of all I covered off the introduction. Introduced the six market series, sorry, the six market structures that I'm going to have in the series. Then the video after that, I looked at perfect competition, explained what that's all about, and gave you some examples and showed you about you know how firms compete on price and that sort of thing. Today I'm going to be looking at monopolistic competition. So monopolistic, not monopoly. They are quite different, but I'll explain that anyway. So alrighty, so what is monopolistic competition? It is a little bit similar to perfect competition, but there is one very, very critical difference. And that is the products are slightly, sometimes a little bit more than slightly different from each other. So you have the same situation where we have many, many buyers and many, many sellers. We have very limited barriers to entry. Firms can come and go as they please. Uh, again, there's more or less perfect information around what each um, firm is selling. So the sellers have got information about what they're doing, the buyers have a pretty much good idea what the sellers are doing but the critical difference is the products are a little bit different and this makes this a lot more of a realistic example than what we have with perfect competition. So when we mentioned about potatoes they are more or less the same but even potatoes can be a little bit different. So what is uh, monopolistic competition then? So that is you'd be looking at things like take fast food for example you have your fast food outputs, you have your McDonald's, your Burger King, your Wendy's, your KFC. They, they sell cheap, quick, fast food, whatever, but they are a little bit different. So they get to compete on price, like we mentioned with perfect competition, but they also get to compete in terms of the products they sell and the, the quality of those products. You know, some, you know, like you can compare like even with cars, for example. It would have to be within the same category, let's say, like compact cars, the various different types of compact cars. They will have similar prices, can be a little bit different, they offer different features. I would argue that luxury cars or exotic cars, compact cars, family cars, they, I would call those different markets so I would make that sort of comparison. And besides, probably cars is probably, we call it oligopoly, that's an interesting one actually, it's somewhere in between oligopoly and monopolistic competition. Okay, maybe another example would be your t-shirts, you know t-shirt here. So t-shirts at places, you know, like Kmart, um, Walmart, uh, Target, whatever, you know, they sell similar sort of t-shirts, not all the same price, different designs, like this Captain America here t-shirt. Oh my gosh, this was like back in the first Captain America movie, so it's quite old now, but hmm, quality is decent, I'm still wearing it, it feels pretty comfortable, picture looks pretty good. But anyway, I was like I'm saying, you know, different t-shirts, different pictures, different, slightly different quality cotton, if that's what it is, or... To be with you, I probably shouldn't be wearing cotton so much these days anyway. Anyway, that's another video in terms of the harmful effects of growing cotton. So, okay, so that is where we sort of deviate a little bit from perfect competition. Another thing is allocative efficiency. People that love their perfect competition will say, perfect competition, allocative efficient. Correct? In that sense that yes, you reached what we call the optimal quantity and price based on within that structure itself. In a sense, you have price equals the cost. So you keep producing and producing and producing until your, your demand is equal to your cost. You know what I mean? So you're not cutting short. Like in monopolistic competition, you would have a slightly lower output because firms have a little bit of say over the price in a sense because their products are a little bit different. So you'd be looking at what we've got our marginal revenue and our marginal cost. So when marginal revenue equals the marginal cost, that's considered your optimal quantity and your optimal price. That, is it, no, sorry, that would be equal your optimal quantity. I get that correct first, yes. So marginal cost equals marginal revenue, that would give you your optimal quantity. You produce any more than that, your marginal cost is going upwards, marginal cost increase as you produce. Uh, that is going to be higher than your marginal revenue, so effectively your profits are getting smaller. If you produce earlier, then your marginal revenue your cost is still below your marginal revenue. So you could produce an extra unit and your marginal revenue is going to be higher than the marginal cost of that extra unit. So if your marginal revenue is higher, effectively that means your profits are going up. Your marginal revenue is higher than your marginal cost. Marginal revenue minus marginal cost gives you the profit for that particular 
um, good that you're selling at, at that level. So as you produce more and more goods, your marginal cost tends to go up. Whereas marginal revenue tends to fall because there's less, as far as it tends to, as more. Okay, so it tends to fall because people, if you look at demand schedule, more and more people want something as the price falls and it follows the demand in that sense. So effectively, if you keep lowering and lowering your price, you'll get a higher demand. So it follows in that sense. Okay, so what about our price? So marginal revenue equals your marginal cost. And then your price that you charge will be what's on your demand curve. So you get that quantity. So how much are people willing to pay? And that you look at your new demand curve. That's what people are willing to pay. And that's what your price would be. So effectively, you've determined your optimal price and your optimal quantity for the firm. It is a bit below what the uh, allocative efficient uh, outcome would be. So that would be lowering your price further and increasing your quantity, which eats into your profits effectively would then reduce your firm profit is almost back to what we say with perfect competition is reducing your profits. It, can I argue that that's a bad thing because you're not producing as much as you should? I'd argue that that is still a good thing because profits essentially are good in that it encourages you to produce more because you have incentive to do so. It also encourages you to improve your technology, lower your costs. So because you've got incentive to do that because you're making profit. So you keep that, whereas you don't have that incentive in perfect competition. No matter what you do, you're earning normal profits in theory. So you're, it's almost like, what is the point, if you know what I mean? So whereas you've got incentive now to do that because you can get profits. And people would argue that this is only short-run profits. Did I mention before about barriers to entry? We really have very, very minimal barriers to entry into monopolistic competition. New entrepreneurs can come in and effectively lower the... Um, we call it lower the price because the higher demand, if you know what I mean? Uh, yes. <laughs> so there's a bit of uh, that in the long run anyway. You can compete and there's perfect information in regards to what the existing firms are doing. So if there's new technology introduced, they can more or less follow suit. So you may say that's a bit of disincentive, but still having short run profits is something. And I could always argue that you never really are in the long run, are you? Because the long run essentially is sequential short runs, isn't it? So you can make a bit of profit, it gets wiped out, incentive to make more profit with you know, other developments and so on. So I still think there is that incentive to do that. And in the long run, because of this incentive to make more profit and lower your costs, effectively you probably will get a higher output and a lower price than what you get with perfect competition. Textbooks are not going to exactly tell you that though, not straight up, but because it's more a sort of a static approach and doesn't include that sort of analysis but it's it's interesting there's also other benefits as well from um, from monopolistic competition and one of those that I like to point out is cooperation and oh my gosh <laughs> here we come to this uh, in Italy Lomazane uh, Lomazane am I pronouncing it correct I normally practice this when I say this beforehand, I just realized that this example is in this video. But anyway, this, this area within Italy, there's lots and lots of small firms that sell sort of metal products and stuff like that, cutlery and things like that. And they tend to cooperate with each other to actually lower their price. So it's essentially like you're getting the benefits of economies of scale, but you have the advantage of having lots of small firms. And being small gives you that dynamic nature in a sense that you can respond to changes in the market a lot easier than a large firm. Large firms offer, often suffer from diseconomies of scale because they're too big. And you don't necessarily get that when you have smaller firms. Essentially acting like it's a larger firm, but still getting getting those benefits of larger firm, but having the advantage of being small as well. You kind of you get what I mean? So what else do you have as well? As I mentioned earlier, there's very few barriers to entry into uh, monopolistic competition. And I consider that actually to be pretty good. So you have lots and lots of small firms and essentially that means more of your workforce can actually be business owners. If you can just think about that for a second. So you have a situation where you have a lot of oligopolies or monopolies. I'll talk about that in another video. That means you have to have a lot of large firms and essentially you will have uh, less owners though. Essentially you have shareholders. Generally shareholders don't necessarily interact in the business dealings, whatever like you'd be if you were an actual entrepreneur yourself. Um, so I think we have an advantage to having lots and lots of small firms. Essentially you can be your own boss. You don't have to work for a larger company. 
And there's a lot of advantages of doing that in a sense. You have a lot more freedom in terms of what you want to do. I, I'm finding it great from personal, because I'm running my own business now and I worked in government for about 10 years and running my own business at Spectrum Economics have a lot more freedom to do a lot more of what I want to do. So that's why I'm making these videos. I'm on Steam and on YouTube and stuff like that. And I also do my business activities as well. I do um, economic um, analysis, economic valuation, cost benefit analysis. I do peer reviews. I, I still do a bit of work here and there for the government in terms of peer review of uh, what we call business cases and I got my economics perspective on that, I can do that. It gives me more things to time to do other stuff as well. Being an entrepreneur, there is a certain amount of risk, but if you're motivated and you're driven, you can actually be quite successful. At the moment, I'm still in my early stages, so I'm not going to say I'm successful at this point in time, but put it this way, I feel that my quality of life has improved by being an entrepreneur. And if you have more monopolistic competition market structures, that makes that option more available. And in, in a sense, like I'm on Steam, that is almost like lots and lots of little businesses within Steam producing your own content. So you can see some resemblance there to monopolistic competition. Though later on in the series, I'll talk about another market structure, which I also think Steam fits into as well, which is oligopsony. We'll talk about that another time. So what examples do we have of uh, monopolistic competition? I mentioned earlier, we've got t-shirts. Uh, we have, oh, what did I say earlier? I said about t-shirts, didn't I? I can't remember what other ones I've got. I've got an example here of bakeries anyway, just to emphasize the point that different bakeries sell slightly different things. And that was part of my contest that I did was with bakeries and all that. How would you operate a bakery and, you know, slight product differentiations between, you know, your danishes and your cakes and your breads and all that. Essentially, it, you still have that price competition because if you're way out of the brackets, you're not going to get people. But you can add that little specialty to your, you know, to your cakes, make them that little bit special. You can add a little bit more to the price. I pay a bit more for my cakes because I'm, I'm vegan. So I have to have the vegan cakes. But I see that being great because of the whole cruelty-free aspect. But it does make them a little bit more expensive. But I feel it's worth paying for that to, you know, to live a cruelty-free lifestyle. So that's my choice. And that is a product differentiation thing if you want to talk about that. So anyway, so just sort of rounding up what I was saying before, you see we've got this garbage truck here. You look carefully, it's actually the back of a bus. And that is what I want to talk about in regards to allocative efficiency and efficiency as a whole. People will argue that monopolistic competition, not as efficient as perfect competition. If you're just looking at the graphs, yes. But in the long run, I can see that the profit is an incentive to improve efficiency in terms of getting better technology, in terms of reducing costs and all that, because you have the profit. And I see profit is a good driving force. If there's no profit, like in perfect competition, then you're not gonna see those advances. Uh, and as you can see, there's a lot more examples of monopolistic competition than there is perfect competition. Now, even with potatoes, it's probably closer to monopolistic competition in many ways. Because there's different ways of growing the potatoes. You get different flavors and things like that. And lots of different things you can do with the potatoes. Yeah, In different countries, the potatoes are going to be a little different because of the soil and lots of other stuff. So it's, it is one of those that's a bit in between market structures. But personally, I thought monopolistic competition could cover off on a lot of that. And if you look at some of the bigger market structures, you look at your oligopolies and your monopolies, Many of them could still work as monopolistic competition as well, even though we talk about some of the structural costs of setting things up, like look at a transport system, look at trains and things like that, I think it has to be a monopoly or oligopoly. It may not necessarily be that way if you can actually share the costs across firms. You have many different operators, but it's something worth thinking, food for thought, some is going to be more difficult than others, but overall monopolistic competition, for me, I feel is the most versatile and probably my favorite market structure, obviously it can't apply to everything, but I think an economy that is predominantly monopolistically competitive is going to be better than uh, economies that are leading towards monopolies or leading towards perfect competition. Anyway, that takes me to the end of this video. This is the second market structure video in the series. Hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I still have a few more to go. My next one will be, I think, oligopoly, then it'd be monopoly, then it'd be the monopsony and oligopsony videos. So, you know, hopefully it's going to get more interesting as the series goes, on, series goes on. And I've also got a lot of other videos as well. You can look at looking at YouTube or even on DTube as well. You can have a look through. Uh, I've got my vegan economic stuff. Now I'm calling it cruelty-free economics. We've changed the name there. 
I've got some of my more controversial stuff, the dark side of economics, you can have a look at that too. And on Steam, I've got a lot of posts, and some of these posts contain videos and some of them don't. Again, lots of good reading material if you want to read on that. I've been doing my Steam series recently and how things apply to Steam. Again, they're all worth a read. And of course, this series, which is initially started off as a written post series, I have all six market structures written out so you've got the details in there as well. So you don't just have to rely on this video. This video, is, you could say, supplements it more than anything else. Anyway, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give me a like, give me an upvote, give me a follow, give me a subscribe. Thank you very much and uh, hopefully you'll be seeing more of me and hopefully I'll be seeing more of you. See you later.